say um, thanks to the Murray people. That's just like a broad sort of denim for the people up in the area whose land I research and live on. And I'd like to thank my supervisors, Professor Linda Cheshire and Dr Zoe Staines. They're great. And I'd like to thank, um, first and foremost, the tenants who helped me with my research because I wouldn't have anything if it weren't for them trusting me to go into their homes. So this is a presentation about people's experiences of home and, their, and how they create that sense of home under the conditions of tenure residualisation in social housing. So, oh, um, so just here's the context, the, the, um, the overall structure of today's presentation. So I've got the context of the study, the concepts I use in the research, the methods I use, um, then we've got some themes emerging from the research. Um, it's in a very early phase. I'm actually still collecting data. So I just put this together out of what I've got. I haven't um, analysed it um, comprehensively. So um, there's more to come. And of course, a lot of the nuance is going to be lost because I'm pushing this into a 20 minute presentation. <laughs> um, so we've, we've also got um, themes of home unmaking and residential alienation and the ways in which people make home under co compromised conditions. Then I've got some prelimin pre preliminary findings and policy implications. So here's the context where I'm researching. So I'm looking in the Brisbane metropolitan area, which is comprised of um, five LGAs. So it's a very low density area. So it's mostly, we're looking at, um, sort of low to medium density, um, where if you look at the states, so unfortunately, Victoria is at the bottom with under 3% social housing. We're just above them. Um, we've got 3.4% stock. Um, so 56% of social tenants in the region live in one to two bedroom dwellings. Um, they're counted by rooms, so I don't actually have a a picture of what exactly the stock is in terms of dwellings. Um, but yeah, it's rel relatively low density. Um, we don't have the high rise towers like you do in Melbourne or Sydney. So when we're talking about residualisation, I'll just explain that. That's a, a welfare term, comes from sort of welfare the theory. Um, so it can apply to any kind of program um, it's most often applied to social housing. And of course, it can happen in other tenures. Um, so when we, so with residualization in social housing, we're looking at um, increased targeting, less stock, um, a, cha a changing um, tenant profile over time. So we're looking at, um, in the past, tenants used to be in the labor force, but today, like the majority, are not so and they're they're explicitly targeting it to people in higher need in fact in queensland since 2019 only people on the high needs list are eligible so it's comes with increased stigma um and so residualization as a process is also uneven so you might find blocks where there's less trouble or you know, properties that are in a really good condition and some that aren't. Um, so it, it's often contrasted with universalism, which is less targeted and covers a broader base of the population, and that's associated with more solidarity and more support. Um, I mean, it never was a big sector in, in Australia, but it's shrinking. And we sort of compare it to other countries, like we've got our comparator countries like um, the UK, where I think they're at 16% shrinking, um, but not as small as our sector. And then you, you can compare it with some of the European countries as well. In fact, there's residualization happening in those sort of arch archetypal um, social democratic countries like Sweden. So here's my conceptual background that I draw from, and there's so much literature, so I've managed to distill it down to this as it pertains to my research. So home is a place 
that is associated with status, privacy, rest, belonging, sanctuary, and autonomy. Um, and it's something that people achieve. It's a process. So people do thing, undertake things to make their home, give it a homely atmosphere. And um, there's different agents of homemaking. So these include neighbours, friends, family, objects, pets, services. Um, and it's embedded in um, different networks. So, and it, it's also experienced at multi levels, it's multi scalar. So you can experience it on the level of the street, the suburb, the nation, the region, like the, the greater region. Um, but then we have this sort of, so a lot of this research came from, um, so it's sort of focused on home ownership and, um, you know, affluent families and it was sort of um, very affirmative and nice and people started to look at the um, the dark, darker side of home. It's also a place where children are abused or where domestic violence occurs. And not only do we make home, home is also unmade. So it can be it can be literally destroyed in the case of domicide, or it can be destroyed in its in its effective sort of constitution. So and and then we also it doesn't preclude home unmaking doesn't preclude home making. People can make home under compromised conditions. So we've got more studies looking at how people create a sense of home in more temporary. Um, circumstances or even squatting or on, on the streets. Um, so that's the conceptual background. Now here are the research questions. So the main overarching question um, is what are the ways in which tenants experience a home within the residualised social housing se sector? How do tenants experience, these are the sub questions, how do ex, um, tenants experience their social housing dwellings as home and what kind of homemaking practices do they engage in to foster that sense of home? What are the so socio-structural conditions of social housing residualisation that impact tenants' sense of home and how might tenants experience home unmaking and in what ways, if at all, is this related to the residualisation of the social housing sector? So, so far, I've got 20 participants out of hopefully 30 to 35, um, 11 are female, 9 are male, 12 identify as having a chronic illness or disability, five house, households um, have a, a member who's Aboriginal and three um, out of the whole sample are Aboriginal themselves and four were born out of overseas. So. Three of them are from the Assisted Passage Migration Scheme, or what we refer to as the 10 pound POMs, and one came from um, post war Europe, uh, continental Europe. So we've, and in that sample, like, like that's just breaking it down in numbers, we've got some pretty unique kinds of experiences and hardships. So we've got a lot of people who've escaped domestic violence, a lot of people who've lost homes in traumatic ways, one person less, um, lost their home through the floods. Um, we, have, we have a member of the Stolen Generations, we have someone who grew up on an Aboriginal mission and had his culture denied to him. So it's more than just, just the numbers, obviously. Um, and I think the age is the, the sort of median age in this would be over 60. So it's sort of close to the national. I think, yeah, the average age is 60 in, in the national statistics. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of looking for more detached dwellings, but they have a lower response rate because there's more people in the household. I'm looking for a bit more community housing as well. So here we've got the methods. So you notice with residualization, if you look it up, it's it's a lot of um, graphs and charts and typologies. So I'm taking a different angle. I want to know what it's like to experience residualization and deal with it on the ground. What does it feel like? What does it smell like? So <laughs> maybe you don't want to know. Um, so it's phenomenologically based. So I don't have time to go into that, but um, so we're looking at sensoria, temporality, 
intentional consciousness, which is conscious, consciousness towards something. So if you've got a neighbour harassing you, your attention's sort of on that and you're just thinking about it. That's an example. We're looking at embodiment, orientation and disorientation. So I'm using hybrid method. How am I going for time? Okay. Um, so I use um, an in-depth, semi-structured interview and I sort of pair that with a, a go along, which is like a walking interview. And I've had to learn on the job. So I've got a lot of participants who are um, mobility impaired and so on. So sometimes we don't even leave the property and we just make, I'll just make sure it's not static, you know, and we walk, we move around. Um, and of course, as a social scientist, I'm a person in the social world. I'm not a scientist looking at a petri dish, so I have an identity. I am a. Um, I have spent a lot of my formative years in residual um, welfare programs. I've done workfare. I've lived in social housing for 22 years. So the one up top there, that detached house, that's my old public housing that I lived in as a kid. And below, that's um, the community housing, and that's the um, good old ambulance, Queensland ambulance and the SWAT team showing up. Um, and that mattress is where I slept last year when I was doing field work because I was, I'm precariously housed, so I'm doing subletting and co-tenancy, and that was not a nice place to be. So I had to pay rent there and not live there. Um, so... I, and I do like a relational process. So it's it's a working relationship with the participants where I disclose things about myself self without trying to lead the interview. So later on in the interview, I'll sort of disclose things like they might have experienced something. So I'll talk to them at, and it, it sort of creates more than rapport, like a working relationship. And it helps lessen the power imbalance between the researcher and participant. So... Just moving on to the next slide. Whoops. What's going on? Down. Oh, this one. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's some of the findings. Um, a lot of people, so for some, like having been in um, temporary accommodation, homeless shelters, living in situations where they're being abuse, institutional context, it gives them like this sense of having their own space, finally being able to sort of have their own space to themselves and not being uh, being told what to do. There's decommodification. So people, they can eat. They can, one guy paid down his debt. Um, it's suitable for living with disability or health condition in some cases. So oh, there's a lot of praise for the Department of Housing's bathrooms. <laughs> Um, they make them accessible. They, they're, they're great at it. Um, a lot of tenants also experience a connection to the area. Not all, but some. They have family history in the area or they have connection to their cultural community. Um, and there's a strong sense of community and mutual aid. So Jason here, he received a mobility scooter when he couldn't walk from a neighbour and he said it was worth thousands was very generous um, and people are connected to amenities um, around their house and in their house. The space makes all the difference. If a person has a bigger dwelling, they love it. Um, so, in so it's not all black and white. So people can have very, they can have negative sort of and positive together, but some Overall, some experiences are more positive than others. Some people, they're not having a great time of it. So these are, these are some of the incursions and disturbances that can happen with the residualised tenure. And also the, broad, the broader sort of political economy sort of seeps into the home. So you've got Alex here describing upstairs neighbours where the dwelling's overcrowded. Um, they all got gastro and one of them was vomiting over the balcony. Um, and then Alan is in his unit block and he described a succession of police sort of raids where they got the battering rams. And, and the other thing is it's bloody hot in Brisbane. And he said, oh, 
I don't know, there was this chemical smell. I couldn't tell what it was. And it was making my eyes water and I had to shut the windows and I had to sweat in this hot box. And it turned out it was a meth lab. And that, 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 that would be something that's quite rare, but quite memorable. Um, and Roland, this this was hard to to deal with. Um, he he was li he's living out in a public housing flat. He's very accomplished, very capable, but he's on the dole. He's subjected to workfare. He struggles with poverty, and it impacts his mental health. And he was worried about a debt. Um, and somebody sort of raised the alarm about the way he was behaving and the police did a welfare check and he said they come in heavy handed and he said it makes his home feel that's a bad memory for him attached to his home it makes it feel like an institution because he felt like he was abducted by the police because he, he went to there's no handles on the door so it makes his home feel like an institution um moving on to the next slide so people deal with this in different ways. So here's an example of um, beds in lounge rooms. So up on your right, um, anyway, um, that's Carol. She lives in a one bedroom unit um, with her son and her two grandkids. Her son and her two grandkids live in her bedroom. She lives in the lounge room. Um, the department of put him, he's on the wait list and um, They've said, oh, you've got 15 months before you get allocated anything. Um, below, that's Alex. He sleeps in his lounge room because he can't sleep in his bedroom because there's fights in the um, car park, so he can't sleep at night. So that's why he's put his bed in the lounge room. Um, so people adapt in different ways to deal with these disturbances. So Bruce had a particularly vexing neighbour who played loud music at night. So this is an example of one of the, the barriers he erected. He actually had more for this neighbour. Um, Alex spent about 14 grand in total um, installing air con and shutter, metal shutters on his window to keep out the noise. And he did it all on Centrelink loans with his disability pension. And there's also creating social, um, social boundaries. So you sort of make boundaries with neighbours, like don't let them in your house and also, um, so like us, some women in the sample, they have like this sub, this this curfew, like they don't go out after night, which is pretty. Um, and the other thing is they do a lot of self-advocacy. So one person describes filling out 15 statutory declarations. Another one said, you've got to get up them. Um, you've got to send MPs letters. Um, so another theme, is sort of detritus and um, objects sort of around the areas. Um, and in, in the complex, there's a lot of homeless people actually come in and sleep there. People also use it to do drugs. So people sort of pick up syringes and the condition, you know, some people, are, they say that they're a bit embarrassed about it, but they also acknowledge that people don't have the resources to move the stuff. So if there's a fridge and a bunch of furniture out the front, they haven't got a car, they haven't got the money to pay a junk, junk collector. Um, and it's also, it has an emotional impact on people. So Carol explained to me, we were looking up her ceiling and she said there was blood spatter from people injecting drugs previously in the unit. And the place was filthy when I moved in. And I, I said, how did it feel moving into a place in that condition? And she said, I felt insignificant. Um, so here are some preliminary conclusions and implications for policy. So you've got to ask, is this, when people have been through so much, you know, fights to get onto the NDIS through the stolen generations, through domestic violence, is it really right to expose to expose them to this residualisation? Um, one of my participants, Margaret, her complex was overgrown. People couldn't get their wheelie. It's a it was a seniors complex, and they couldn't get their wheelie walkers through the grass. There was a lot of standover and intimidation. Um, 
and she she advocated for herself a lot and she said she was on the phone and she said she she had a person at her complex actually sleeping in the driveway and he exposed himself to the tenants and he and she said to me like you know Albanese is always going on about how he was raised in a public housing unit by his single mother I said now I don't think he would want his mother treated in this way she's referring to the way that the department treats her um and she she said she's basically being abused by the department of housing craig um he witnessed a lot of deaths overdoses non-normative sort of deaths police and ambulances rocking up and he thought oh i'm going to go out of this place like this um so it's a degraded social status that's communicated to people through the physical environment and the ten the tensions impact on people's ability to relax and unwind in their own homes and a lot of people do hit back against the stigma they don't accept that passively they they challenge that now here are the tenants thoughts on policy many expressed a deep gratitude for public housing um, one person referred to it as heaven and Deborah said, if I didn't have this, I didn't know where I'd be. And it acts, it acts as a, a, um, a safety net for contingencies, but will it continue to act as that in the future as we whittle it down? Um, now, there was some reference to the deserving and undeserving distinction, but there were explicit critiques of residualization and people were advocating for universalism so pam said i wish there were a lot more of them social housing dwellings it should be for anyone not just people on disability and people that have mental health issues it needs to be for anyone because that's the way it used to be and terry said they should stop selling public houses and i reckon down here they wouldn't want them knocked down <laughs> okay that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mel. We might have questions at the end. Um, so, yeah, Nick, would you like to come up? I'll just get your presentation. Thanks. So hi everyone. Uh, I'm being properly, probably, properly introduced already. And well, what I'm presenting today is two things because uh, the work which is the most important today is the impact of public housing renewal in Melbourne social diversity is a work in progress. And I wanted to tell a story on how I got there. So it presents to you my PhD to give you some context and then go through the data that we have so far around the, the impact of public housing renewal. Uh, before that, uh, just a quick positionality. I'm a Brazilian immigrant in Australia. And that's uh, that and the, the, my background as an environmental analyst as an urban planner it's important for me in the way I read the world is, and also in the way, in the questions I have on how things work. And I thought it was important to uh, highlight that because uh, especially in, in Brazil, we have uh, an impact is such an important thing. And in, we have a lot of research that is direct, directly connected with communities, directly connected with impacting extension. And I try to bring that to my research and I try to advocate for that here in Australia. Um, well, as Priya, thank you for that introduction said, I'm also part of the Alliance for Praxis Research. Uh, so my research, my PhD, which has just finished, if it, it focuses on encounters with difference with people that don't know each other happening on public spaces. And that's has a whole context of, of so of social segregation. That's why I'm studying that and how social segregation creates so many exclusionary mechanisms that affect the way cities work. And from that I had I had on my PhD three research questions. One of those questions was how can we think social diversity in a different way that is not just uh, limited to ethnicity, 
because a lot of times people would say, would use those things as the same, ethnic diversity and social diversity. And what that means is that you relate the impact of, of uh, you, you limited social diversity and you start associating social diversity to specific things like criminality, like other things, like we have a lot of papers doing that. And I wanted to brought it up, the age of social diversity and understand there is different and diverse social diversities in Melbourne, for example. And some of them will be associated with vulnerability. And that's what I discussed in my paper, which ones were, what, what kind of social diversity is associated with social vulnerability, economical vulnerability, and all of that, and also why that happens. After that, I try to understand what does that mean for people, for social interactions happening in public space? What does that, how people interact differently on those different social diversity contexts? So I did observations and I did interviews with people. I'm not going to get into that data, but I just, uh, it, this was important to introduce on how I got to the public housing questions. So this is, might be difficult to read, but my work was, a one of that steps was a multi-scale analysis that tried to understand this, those different social diversities in Melbourne and the observations and public space. Uh, what brought my attention when I did that kind of cluster analysis that understood those different social diversities is that even in places that are highly gentrified or is hard to access. Uh, hard to, hard to uh, access financially, like in a Melbourne, there's still a lot of people from different countries, different incomes living there. And one of those reasons is, as we could see visually, is the public housing. And that was not necessarily all my PhD. I started working with that already. So everything you see from here is uh, a work in progress. Now is my time. So uh, in this map, you can see each person is a dot. This is match block information from 2016. And the blue dots are Australians, people born in Australia, and the other dots are people born in different countries or continents. I have to put people together. So what you what brought our attention visually is that the public housing, you can see here, 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 here. It's such an important instrument in the urban fabric to support uh, diversity of the the most basic diversity that we can talk about, which is people coming from different countries birth. So we started digging in into that data and seeing what, as soon as we heard about the, the demolition, which in the words of Dan Andrews, he said that they need to go. We don't know why, but he said the public housing needs to go. Um, sorry. I started working with Libby, David, and Priya, and to understand what would that mean? What, what, what is the impact of that uh, demolition and removal over the demography of those neighborhoods? So as we can see here, uh, people are already represented. A lot of, uh, most of the people on public housing are born overseas. So the most extreme case is Richmond where you have 2.5 times more people born overseas than born in Australia, you feel that? And again, this is just one indicator you, I will show as well as astrology and there are other things that you can explore, but I decided to just talk about country of birth. And I keep doing that using that one. So when we look at the population that is going to be removed, if that happens, with the demolition of the towers, we can see that 60%, for example, of people born in sub-Saharan countries will be totally removed from that from those neighborhoods. So if you look at all the neighborhoods together, that means that 60% uh, of the entire population born in those countries are gonna not be there anymore. <clears throat> uh, and you can look at other like Fitzroy is similar to the extreme case where four towers will be removed. 
If that happens, 90% of, of the population born in North African countries will be removed from Fitzroy. There will be only 90% of people born in, in Sub-Saharan countries left in Fitzroy. And that goes to all the nationalities. Uh, in comparison, just in comparison, only 10% of people that claim to be born in Australia will be removed in, in Fitzroy. Just as, as a comparison. And those 10%, of course, they can still be have ancestralities that are not from here, could be from somewhere else. <clears throat> Why I did that. So this just to illustrate again sub-Saharan African and North African people born in those areas. This is just to visually illustrate what would that mean. So here is the towers to be removed. And you will see that disappearing from the urban fabric in the, in the process of, of social housing demolition. If we look at indigenous people, we will see the displacement happening again. So summing up, the demolition removes 12, almost 12% 12 of the total indigenous population living in those suburbs. Uh, and the maps illustrate that. The most extreme case is in Pittsburgh, if the towers are removed, 80% of the population that declared to be indigenous living in Fitzroy will be removed. And this is just uh, to show the map from Collingwood, Carlton, but also from Flemington, North Melbourne, which are other areas that uh, North Melbourne is uh, one that is closer because this process will take a few years, but North Melbourne will soon be, according to the plans, uh, the towers will be demolished there. So again, this is a work in progress. Like I said, we have been we've been paying more attention to Carlton, Flemington, and North Melbourne. And and I've been working with the my group, the Alliance for Brexit Research. We've been working in Kensington because one of the arguments that that the government has is around the public lands. So they call a lot of times, not directly, but they call that space that is there as a waste, waste of space. The space that can be used for other things because there is a lot of public space surrounding the towers. There is a lot of green space. And in, for example, in Kensington, they have a food forest that produced tons of food for the community during COVID times. And those foods, this food was donated back to the community. And we've been working with them because they're interested in uh, having that evaluation uh, of how important that is. Although, I, yeah, I don't necessarily see why, but it's sometimes important for the government to hear that. So we've been documenting that as well, trying to document that that's not a wasted space. There is a lot happening. It's in, so they are important green spaces that should be uh, considered. So that was. It. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Or thank you so much, um, Nick and Mel. Um,